I'm gonna close out our family tree service uh, by talking about the lady in Jesus' family tree. We just sang about Mary, who is the mother of Jesus. So if you guys could open your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter one. I wanna look at Matthew chapter one, uh, verses 18 through 25. Um, and, and I'm gonna get a little crazy with Christmas. Can you guys handle two texts this morning? We're gonna flip over to Matthew 22 then. Matthew one is the story, Matthew's version of Jesus' birth. We just read, didn't Genesis do a great job uh, sharing the Christmas story in Luke this morning? Thank you, Genesis. Um, and we're gonna look at uh, Matthew chapter one and then flip over to Jesus in his 30s in Matthew chapter 22. I just wanna look at one verse there. Can we stand in honor of the reading of God's word today? When somebody has the text this morning, say amen. Um, if you don't have it, we'll get that up on the screen for you. Otherwise, you can turn your Bible on, on your phone and follow along. This is the word of the Lord, Matthew chapter one, verses 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiance, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit and she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not, as Pastor Christian said last week, dance with her <laughs> until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. You guys can now turn over, flip a few pages to Matthew chapter 22. I just want to look at one verse in Matthew chapter 22. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees of the time, the religious leaders, and he asked them a question that I kind of want to circle around today. He asked them the question, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They replied, he is the son of David. Uh, today, um, from these wonderfully juicy texts in scripture. I just wanna share a word with you that I've simply titled, That's Impossible. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, that's impossible. That's impossible. You all can be seated this morning as we dive in. Did you guys enjoy the worship this morning? Um, love our worship team, love, love what God is doing. That's impossible. I wanna share just under that uh, title this morning. If you're new here, um, we're trying to build into our culture just so you guys know that we're a preach back kind of place. And so can you guys practice and somebody just give me the first thing, amen, hallelujah, glory to God. Uh, you know, whatever you got, come on, how many of you know um, God is worth responding to? Um, in Matthew chapter 22, we find Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, uh, which once again are the religious leaders of the day asking them a question to really clear up who he really is and who he came to save. And one thing I've been doing over the course of the year is really, um, I kind of did this on accident and I had so much fun doing it that I just kept on doing it, is really looking at different questions Jesus would ask people and pulling out this principle that when Jesus asks you a question, he's not looking for more information. When Jesus comes and asks you a question, Jesus is all knowing. How many of you people are like, we know that, right? And so when Jesus comes to ask you a question, it's not that he's looking for more information. Jesus asks questions to reveal what's truly in your hearts. And so Jesus has a revealing question to the Pharisees the religious leaders of the day, and he comes to them and simply asks the Pharisees this question. He, he asks them, whose son is Jesus? What do you make of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And it's an interesting question. And I just want to talk to you this morning from that question from a few moments today, that same question, whose son is he? Because it's a question that needs to be asked in every age, to every person, in every generation, uh, just whose son is Jesus? Because how you answer that question, I want to show you today, it's of the utmost 
important. This is the question that Matthew begins his gospel addressing. Just who is the son? Um, uh, whose son is Jesus Christ? And Matthew goes into great detail in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 16, laying out 16 different verses, 42 different generations, what we've been talking about, from Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, all the way down the line, establishing the bloodline of Jesus, answering the question, whose son is Jesus? And goes into great detail answering this. And in the Matthew 1 and 18, after he goes through all these different things, Matthew then goes, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant. How, might you ask, through the power of the Holy Spirit? Now, there has some, been some interesting births throughout history. I was doing some research this week. There's been some interesting births. You find people that are born in crazy places, in crazy circumstances. I actually found this week that the oldest modern birth. Um, I started thinking about this because this is how old my mom is. And I was like, this is kind of nasty. 66 (laughs) years old. A woman gave birth to twins when she was 66. Come on, you're supposed to be a grandma. You know, like, let's go. There's been some interesting births throughout time. I found even some people have given birth to quintuplets. I had to look up what quintuplets were. It's not, you know, twins or triplets. It's five at one time. Ladies, can you imagine? Like one is enough, right? Five at one time. There's been some interesting births throughout history, but there has never been a birth ever in the history of humanity as spectacular, amazing, miraculous as Mary being born of a virgin or being a virgin and giving birth to Jesus. And what we see here, Matthew begins his gospel to tell and affirm that Jesus Christ was indeed born of a virgin named Mary. Now, I'm guessing if you look around this morning, even online, what you're going to see is we have a very diverse church. How many of you guys are thankful to be in a diverse setting? Um, you know, it's one thing I love about Anthem Church. Um, that we're a very diverse church. And what you're going to find when you walk in here, there's, there's new Christians, there's people who are still trying to figure out if this Jesus thing is real, and, and then people who have been in church for a really long time. We, we have people that come from a denominations that I didn't even know existed. There's people like from all these different things. Somebody told me they come from like the POW. I was like, isn't that a prisoner of war? Like what, like where, you know, we got people from all kinds of, of different denominations. But by show of hands today, even though where you came from, whether you're new to this or you've been around for a while, by show of hands, can you help me participate. How many of you guys would say today you've heard about the virgin birth through Mary? Yeah, we've heard it, right? And and I would pray today that that you would stand with me on this. It's not just something that we heard, but it's actually call us crazy, but it's actually something that we believe that Jesus Christ was indeed born of a virgin named Mary all those years ago. It's something that we believe that we live by. But some of you here today might might be sitting here thinking like, "Um, you know what? I don't know if I'm buying that like Jesus being born of a virgin. You know, it sounds like a great story, but it's just in line kind of like with me seeing a unicorn. It's kind of impossible. It's kind of just as as impossible. Like is the White Sox winning the World Series, right? It's just like impossible. So some people believe that Jesus was born, and, and yes, that he was a good man, But the whole idea that he was born of a virgin, it's like, no way, it's impossible. And you may be wondering how, in today's day and age, how can people actually believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? In fact, I was shocked this week in study. I came across um, a poll study, a statistic, that that somebody interviewed a bunch of seminarians. If you don't know, seminarians, uh, they're studying to be pastors in church, okay? And this the study actually revealed um, that they interviewed these people 10 years ago that 56% of seminarians did not believe in the virgin birth. Now, this is kind of problematic for a couple reasons. Number one, these people are gonna be preaching the gospel, right? And, and because if you throw out Matthew 118, what you need to understand is that you actually throw out Jesus' death and ultimately his resurrection, resurrection actually mattering. And I'm going to explain that to you today because Jesus Christ, born of a virgin named Mary, is central to Christianity. The virgin birth is at the foundation of everything we believe is Christian. So I want to show you today this is why it's such a big deal and why we really have to get this right. Because the virgin birth, I'm telling you today, is truly what makes the impossible possible today for each and every one of us. Let me show you three things that we learned this morning from the virgin birth. 
Mary birth. How many of you guys are ready to dive into God's word a little bit deeper? So Matthew tells this story pretty matter-of-factly. He says, this is how Jesus was born. Now we know in cultural norms back in the day that Mary was probably about 15 or 16 when this happened. How about, that's like, that's really young, right? She's 15 or 16 years old. And in this time you, you would arrange your marriage and she was set up with this guy named Joseph. They were engaged. Mary was engaged to Joseph. And while she was engaged, Matthew simply lays out, she became pregnant, not by Joseph, but by the Holy Spirit. Now, Matthew is pretty matter of fact. Luke, uh, which Genesis read for us in Luke 2, um, gives a little bit more detail. How many of you guys know Luke is actually a doctor? And he goes into great detail to tell about the, the story of how this went, came to pass. And so Luke 2, we read how it happened. Luke 1 comes before it. And this is what Luke says and how uh, Mary became pregnant. It says in Luke 1, 29 through 34, about the 15, 16-year-old Mary, Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive... And give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of the ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now watch Mary's response in verse 34. But how can this happen? I am a virgin. She's like, excuse me, angel, help me understand this. My translation of this, like, I know Joseph, angel, you're supposed to be supernatural, but I don't know him like that yet. Don't you know what you're talking about? We haven't gone there yet. This is impossible. And what I love about this is that when the angel of the Lord came to Mary, what the angel asked her to do, it wasn't just difficult, church, it was impossible. And we really need to understand today when God calls you to do something, it's not just that it's difficult because difficult you can do, but impossible you can't. It doesn't even start, listen, to be God in scripture until it's impossible. What, what am I trying to say today? The first lesson we learned through Mary and the virgin birth, it's really a powerful thought I think, is that impossible is God's starting point. This is where the Christmas story begins. It begins at impossible. And sometimes maybe I'm the only one, but maybe I could get at least three, four witnesses. You feel like what God has called you to is hard, right? It's like, it's difficult. You know, it's like, man, God, how is this gonna happen? It's so challenging. But, but difficult is difficult. Hard is hard. But pre pregnant teenage virgin, that ain't hard. That's impossible. And I got some good news for you today. What Mary teaches us, that when you're facing an impossible situation, can I tell you today, this is good news. What she teaches us, you're just right for God. If God called you to something and you can't afford it, can I tell you, you're just right for God. If God called you to something and you know you don't have what it takes, it's impossible in your own strength, how many of you can testify today? You're just right for God. I'm trying to reframe the way that I think because I know what God called me to. It's like, God, you've seen my checking account. God, you know my IQ. But instead of complaining about it, I'm going to start rejoicing about it because when God called me to do something impossible, what it means in my life now is that he's getting ready to flex on my behalf. And so instead of complaining, I'm just going to start praising because impossible, church, is God's starting point. Church, this is where I believe God is calling you. This is where I believe God is calling us as we close out one year and head into another year. I believe God is calling us into the realm of impossible. The place with God where we just don't read about it. Where we just don't declare it. But we actually believe it. Where we truly believe that our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything you could ever ask or even think that we actually believe it and I wish I had a witness today that our eye has not seen our ears have not heard nor has it entered into our hearts the things that God has for us we need to get into that impossible realm and I believe that we're entering into a season where God is going to reveal that one of his names is suddenly 
I believe we're getting into a season where God is going to reveal that he truly is the God of impossible. I believe we're entering into a season where God is about to show us that he is a way maker, that he means the kind of God who can make a way where there is no way. I believe that we're entering a season, church, where it's going to be like the children of Israel, even after they were freed, they came to the Red Sea and didn't know what to do. But our God's the kind of God who can split a sea so you can walk right through it. You see, church... We serve the kind of God who can literally make something out of nothing. And impossible is his starting point. And here's the thing. This is what the virgin birth is teaching us. When, when it comes to Mary, uh, the, the angel comes to Mary and says, this may be impossible for you, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and that same power that's about to uh, come upon her is the same power that's actually alive in you after Jesus was raised from the grave. is now in you. Because of that, God's going to make possible in you and through you what was once impossible. And church, I, I don't know what God has called you to do. But all I'm saying to you is the birth of Jesus through the Virgin Mary today shows us today that impossible is where God starts. And listen, miracles are what God does. I really want to encourage us to get that in our spirit today. Impossible is where God starts. Miracles are what God does. And you know, church, I can always tell when somebody's expecting. I know very physically, um, uh, Christina works here. You know, she's going to have a baby next month, you know. Can you imagine if you're pregnant and you just don't expect, like, you're just, you're just like, oh, the baby's going to come, then I'll figure it out later. You know, I can always tell when people are expecting something spiritually. Why? Because you actually start preparing for it. You just don't talk about it. You know, and because I really do believe this with all my heart that God's actually going to make a way where there is no way in us and through us, well, I just don't want to talk about it. I am actually expecting it, right? And because I expect it, we're going to start preparing for it. Now, here's the thing. If you were here, how many of you guys were here uh, before COVID-19? Does anybody remember what life was like? It's hard to even think sometimes. Um, but before all this kind of came down, we actually had three services full of people when we were running out of room. And if you look around now, like all, half our chairs are out and we do a lot more online, which is great. But here's the thing. Our services are still pretty full. And so we've been brainstorming. We've been praying. We've been seeking the Lord. We've been trying to see what we can do. And I'm really excited today because we believe God's going to do it next year. Here's what we're going to do. If you turn around, there's a wall right there that divides this auditorium to the gym. That wall is actually going to be removed. And we're doubling our seating capacity here uh, to continue to lead more people to know Christ. And to make Christ known. And here's the thing. They might not be here yet, but I believe God's going to do it. And I'm going to be ready for it because our God is the God of suddenly. And so get ready, get ready, get ready. It might be a little messy. Get here early if you want to sit like somewhere where you can actually see because it's a long thing. But how many of you know that it's worth it because God is good? And so I'm telling you, I'm just telling you today, the virgin birth shows us that that impossible is God's starting point. Now, the angel comes to Mary as the story goes on. It gets really interesting. It says, you're going to give birth to the Savior of the world. Now, now I want you to try to put yourself for a moment in Mary's shoes. Um, she's a bit concerned. She's a bit worried. And rightfully so. Now, number one, you got you to kind of try to get in her shoes a little bit. Uh, number one, how many of you know this is a bit hard to explain? Has God ever spoken anything to you, but then you know you have to say it out loud and people might commit you for what you said out of your mouth? You know, can you imagine Mary now actually having to speak this to Joseph, her fiancé? You know, it's really interesting in Scripture um, it says that Mary, we don't know quite how this went down. In the King James Version, it says that she was found to be pregnant. Now, I take that as one day maybe Joseph saw her and looked at her and said, Mary, have you put on a few LBs? You know? And then it came, I don't know. You know, it says that she was found to be pregnant. We, we don't know how this happened, but we just know that sooner or later, um, she actually had to tell Joseph how this happened. Now, you got to understand this. For, for me personally, you know, if Taylor, I love my wife. I've been married 16 years, and I'm not just saying this. I just love being married. You know, it's great. And uh, I've been married 16 years. But I got to tell you, I love Taylor when we were engaged. But if she came to me with this story, and I don't have a ring on my finger yet, you know, like, she came to me. Guys, could you imagine your fiance comes to you? Listen, you know, you know you've been behaving. She comes to you, hey, before you jump to conclusions, listen, I didn't cheat on you. The Holy Ghost visited me last night and impregnated me. I love Taylor before we were engaged, but I would have never said I do. I'm just saying, like, you crazy. You know, like the Holy Ghost came and impregnated you. This is, this is something. I'm not buying that. And secondly, you've got to understand this about Mary, why she's a little nervous. We don't get this quite in our culture today. But back then, getting pregnant, 
outside of marriage, you got to understand, was a huge deal. So huge that Mary literally could have been stoned to death for being pregnant outside of wedlock. And what you, we also don't understand is that this situation, uh, many people believe followed her her whole life. That wherever she would go, people would look at Mary and say, oh, there goes Mary the hood rat. You know, she ain't nothing but a hoochie mama. Hood rat, hood, yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> Too early, I'm always ready, okay. <laughs> you know, she's got to go around and her whole life, this follows her. You know, people are looking at her, Mary said this, but we all know what really Happen. This pregnancy could have cost her her family. It could have cost her her upcoming marriage. It cost her her reputation. It could have cost her her life. And so when she goes to Joseph to tell him, I'm pregnant, we know the end of the story, but don't miss over this. They didn't. Can you imagine having to go to your future spouse telling this epic tale? So I can picture Mary being worried. How is this going to work out? There's a lot that needs to come together. You know, all these things when you have to actually do what God says, like where in the world is this going to happen? But once again, impossible is God's starting point. Impossible is where God starts. Miracles are what God does. So Mary has a problem. Mary goes and tells Joseph. And we don't know once again how it went down. All we know now is Joseph knows. And when Joseph finds out, like most dudes here, I think we would say, he's like, I'm going to leave Mary. And here's what the word t- teaches us what happens next. Right in the text, Matthew 1 and 19, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. Now, verse 20, really important. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So the angel now confirms the very same word that Mary told him. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. Now verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Now just like that, listen. Just like that, because this is how God works. Mary's wondering, how is this all going to work out? And then all of a sudden, God shows up, and the problem is supernaturally solved. You know what I love in this story? I've never seen this before this week, and God really imprinted this on my heart. And I pray that you get excited about this, as I got excited about this, as Mary's trying to figure the whole thing out. How is this going to work out? Well, Mary was worrying about the problem. God was in the background working on the solution. It's like God is saying, Mary, I understand that this pill is a hard pill to swallow and Joseph's probably not going to buy it. So why don't I just come and prove to you that I am the God of Ephesians 3.20, that I'm the God who comes and works all things together for the good of those who love me. This text is teaching us today through the eyes of Mary that our God is the kind of God who is working on what you're worried about. Did did you guys get this out? I just said God is working on what you're worried about. Middle set, did you guys get this online maybe? God is working on what you're worried about. Well, you're worried about it. God is in the background working on it. And I found this to be so true in my life. And you know, sometimes in the middle of a storm, you got to sit back and remind yourself, church, that our God is the kind of God who is working even when you can't see it. And I've seen this time and time again in my life. Can can I have any other witnesses that you know that what you're worrying about God is working on? You know, a couple years ago, um, we lived in the city at the time. I was walking down the street. I've told this story before. And and God gave us like this pretty clear vision um, for for something called Anthem Church. Now, you guys are sitting in this today. So if you don't know the story, I'm going to tell it in about two minutes. But God gives us a vision. But how many of you know, he'll speak something, then you don't know the next step. you got to be faithful, you got to be obedient. So this was years ago. We have a vision to start Anthem Church, and we're the pastors at Christian Life Center. This is what this church was formerly called of Hammond, Indiana. So we're here. We're under a different spiritual covering. Pastor Jerry McQuay was great. Everything's going good. And, and last year, two years ago in December, I'm doing my daily Bible reading, and I read a scripture. And God, you ever have it where God just imprints something on you, and you know, like right now, this is my word for you? God speaks to us very clearly and says, this is the season you're to birth Anthem Church. And I'm like, God, this is a little challenging. Our church just doubled in size in two weeks. 
And you come and now speak to us and say it's time to go do something else. But deep down, I really thought that this church, Christian Life Center Anthem, or Hammond at the time, was supposed to become Anthem. I just didn't know how. And so I saw counsel. We prayed, and I did the only thing I knew I needed, I uh, could do after seeking counsel. I walked into Pastor Jerry McQuay's office two years ago, and, and a lot of people don't know this. I actually resigned as the pastor of this church because I knew God was calling us to birth anthem, and obedience is better than sacrifice. And I'm like, I God, I just got to do it. And I didn't know how we was going to do it. So I walked in. It was one of the hardest days of my life because I loved the people. I loved this city. I felt like God called us here, and I didn't know what to do. So I walked into the office. I resigned. Pastor Jerry said, okay. He understood that God was speaking. And so he said, here's what I want you to do. Um, In four months, the board of directors is going to be coming in town. Why don't you just wait? In the meantime, we're going to try to find your replacement. We're doing all these things. We're going through this. Nobody knows what's going on. We pull up to the board of directors meeting, and there's some big people in the kingdom of God in this boardroom. I'm nervous out of my mind. I'm like trembling as I walk in. I'm fighting depression because I know that I have to walk away from the very thing that I felt like God called me to. And I'm walking in, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how God is going to do it. I don't know what's going on. But little did I know that meanwhile, while I was walking in the room, I didn't know who was in that room. I didn't know that two of the members on the board of directors, that on their way flying flying into Chicago, that God spoke to them the same word. I didn't call them. I didn't talk to them. I barely know them. But God spoke to them on our behalf and said, hey, Pastor Jerry, I think that Sam and Taylor are supposed to have that church so Anthem can be in Hammond. And here we are. Today is Anthem Church. And I walked out that room, and I had my own little praise party. I shouted for the first time in my, you know, like, let's go, you know. (laughs) But I was like, hey. (laughs) But I knew, how am I going to recover from that? God was working on what I was worried about. God proved to me that he truly is the God who works all things together for the good of those who love him. And I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but I told you that story to say this. If God called you to it and you don't see it yet, take some peace and joy today knowing if God needs to speak to somebody, he'll speak to them. If God needs to move somebody out the way, he'll move them out the way. If God needs to unlock a door, guess what? He got the keys. God is working on what you're worried about. This is a message that Mary teaches us through this, through this divine pregnancy. Now, we are thinking, you know, on this whole idea of worry, how many of you guys know that, that there's been plenty of things? Can we just, like, keep it real and kind of drop that whole line, faith over fear? You know, it's like, yeah, I get it, you know? Like, but can we just be honest today and say, hey, 2020, there, there's been a lot of things that it's been pretty easy to be worried. You know, it's been worry. worry. It's easy for worry to creep in. And, and I know some of you have been worried, and, and we've been praying. Like, I, and I just want to show you how this principle works that God is working on what you're worried about. We were praying as a church and God started speaking to us. Um, in the midst of a pandemic, um, God has been so faithful um, that, that we're really blessed here, even through the midst of this. How many of you guys know God is good and you guys have been faithful and you've been great stewards and it's been amazing. And so we, we were just praying and God started speaking to us and, and it got a little scary, but um, kind of reminded us of, of James 127 that says true religion is really taking care of the widows and the orphans. And I know it's been hard for some nonprofits out there. And so we started really praying and we felt like God was leading us to to bless some people, to show this principle that God is working on what you might be worried about. So today I'm really excited. Um, We we told this last night, told him to keep it a secret, but one of our very own, because we believe God's word that we're to take take care of the widows, Um, one of our very own, Lysandra Hutchinson, uh, started a ministry called Grace and Grief through a trying time in her life. And I can imagine it's a pretty big call. And so we just wanted to know, Lysandra, that God is with you. And uh, we actually uh, wrote a check and it's in the mail for $5,000 to Grace and Grief um, with your name on it uh, because we believe in what God has called you to do. So that 
check is on the way for, for $5,000. And we were thinking, though, the text says widows and orphans. And uh, you guys were so faithful. We actually uh, delivered over $2,500 of gift certificates to the um, Carmelite Orphan Home yesterday. You guys can give yourselves a big round of applause. Um, there's 50 plus uh, kids that live there uh, waiting to be adopted. Some of them, unfortunately, probably never will. And uh, we were able to provide each and every one of those through your generosity, 50 to $75 of gifts for each and every kid there. Uh, but we thought, you know what, that's awesome. But why don't we double down on that? So we sent them another check for $2,500. And that's in the mail to Carmelite Home. And then we were just like thinking like, man, God, you've been so good. And he kept on talking. How many of you guys know? It's like, God, will you stop talking? You know, this is getting hard, you know. And so then there's this other organization that's really focused on taking care of adoptive and, and foster kids. And it's an awesome organization called Love Moves Us. And so Jason Benson, there's a, there's a check in the mail for $2,500 made out to you as well. And um, because God is working on what you're worried about, God will speak to other people on your behalf, even when you don't even ask. But then we got to thinking, you know what? True religion is taking care of the widow and orphan, but our heart here is really uh, for churches. How many of you guys know, can we just all agree that other churches are not our competition? That, that, you know what, we can see this whole city saved. And when that happens, here's the thing. There's not enough room in every single church to fit all the people in our city alone. So churches are not competition. And, and this has been a hard year for some churches. It's been a lot of different changes. And it's interesting here because uh, we have quite a few pastor's kids. And it's really kind of probably why we're a little messed up if you walked in here and you're new because we have a lot of pastor's kids. We all need counseling. I know I'm a pastor's kid and it's an interesting life. Um, but we started really kind of praying about some churches to support. And Pastor Isaac's dad uh, pastors a church called Breath of Life Praise and Worship Center in, in Louisiana, Pastor Mike Robinson. And uh, they were not only affected by COVID, but you guys know a hurricane blew through there and really messed things up. And so Pastor Mike Robinson, on behalf of Anthem Church, there's a check for $2,500 in the mail to you. And then um, our very own... Uh, Mania, who's sitting in the front row uh, today, her dad pastors a church in the city called Parkway Garden Christian Church. And uh, they've been doing some unbelievable work with the homeless in Chicago, and we wanted to support that. So there's a check for $2,500 to Pastor Edward Morris in Parkway Garden Christian Church. And then some of our friends, they just planted a church in Las Vegas. How many of you guys know Las Vegas needs Jesus? Come on, somebody in. <laughs> And they felt like God called them to plant a church in, in the middle of Las Vegas. And, and we really believe in the mission on what they're calling. And, and planting a church is hard. Planting a church right now is really hard. And so he actually texted me while we were praying about who to support. And so we're like, man, God, this is you. And so Aaron and Ashley Pino in Overflow Church in Las Vegas, I know you're tuning in right now. Here's the thing. We got a check for $5,000 on the way for you. Because God is working on what you're worried about. Well, you're worrying. God is in the background working. And isn't that amazing? Just like that, $20,000. But then we started thinking. God kept on talking. I'm like, would you stop talking? <laughs> There's some individuals here um, who have really been inspiring that have really been operating by faith in the middle of a hard season. And so we're blessing 10 different people at our church today. And um, we're not going to announce all of them. We, we named a couple last night. Um, there's a couple watching online right now. Antonio and Tanisha Aranda. Um, we know God. Um, we know you've been going through a hard time. Uh, there's a check for $1,000 on the way for you. Um, which... Um, we pray that that blesses you. Um, we've been so excited about the work God is doing at Purdue Northwest University in Hammond, Indiana. And um, it was such a miracle. Last week we had 30 students on Sunday night here. Um, we don't even like talk about it that much, but it's been such an amazing thing. And so we've actually um, blessing two st uh, students at Purdue Northwest. We just made a tuition on one's behalf that was kind of going through a little bit for $1,500. And then another student there um, had a really tough year. And so we actually are buying his books for next semester and giving him some grocery monies for a total of $1,000 as well. Um, RJ Abbott, I know you're online right now. How many of you guys love RJ? Um, 
RJ would never tell you this herself, so don't be mad at me, but um, her father-in-law got COVID, lives in Texas. RJ just got a job. She asked her job for a leave of absence where she didn't get paid from and left to go down to Texas for four weeks without getting paid to take care of her father-in-law. How many of you guys know that's godly? And so RJ, we got a check for $1,000 on the way to you. Dominique Cardi, how many of you guys love Dominique Cardi? She is as faithful as they come. She leads our pastoral care team here. And her husband had a stroke. But she keeps on serving and doing all these things. And so, Dominique Cardi, Merry Christmas. There's a check for $1,500 on the way to you. And then uh, I got a couple checks here. Can I, can I keep going for a minute? I'll do it anyways. I don't care. <laughs> Myra and Sean. Christian, can you bring this to them? Um, we know by faith that your family just grew unexpectedly. Myra's not pregnant. She's not the 60s. <laughs> um, but uh, we wanted you to know that God uh, really honors what you just did without going into detail. And so there's a check for $1,000 there for you to help <laughs> offset the costs. Because God is working on what you've been worried about. And we love you guys. Can you guys shut your hands out towards Myra? I know I'm, I don't have this much time, but I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> Myra, during worship, the Lord started speaking to me on your behalf. And he started pointing out the women in the family tree of Jesus. And he said, I'm going to do the same thing that I did in their life and yours. And I hear the Lord even saying that he's redeeming your family tree. That all the pain of the past, all the hurt, all the brokenness, I hear the Lord saying, I'm about to show you that my name is Redeemer. And I plead the blood of Jesus over you, your brother, your children. And I hear the Lord saying, his word will not return void. That God is going to be faithful. He's going to show you in your latter days that he is the God who makes all things possible. Lord, I thank you for Myra. I thank you for Sean. I thank you for their testimony. In Jesus' name. And uh, Ashley Campbell. Hey, Ashley. Um, we're praying for you, and the Lord gave me a scripture for you. It's Philippians 1 and 6. I hear the Lord saying over your life that he's about to show you that he's the God of Philippians 1 and 6, that the same one who started it will be the same one that finishes it. Today, we wanted to bless you with a $1,000 check um, to do with whatever you want <laughs> uh, because we believe God's hand is on your life. And um, If you guys don't know, um, can you bring this to her? Um, we're going to pray for you in a minute too, but um, Ashley was the one who we made a video about who went got down and got baptized. and She was raised to the life of Christ, but God is going to do the work in your life, young woman. Stretch your hands out towards Ashley. Lord, I bless her with all the blessings of God that every promise is yes and amen. God, I thank you for her children. I thank you for her family. God, I thank you, Lord, for even those unspoken prayer requests that I hear you saying right now. I'm not going to say it out loud, but God, I thank you for the right situation at the right time, the right house, the right situation, the right city. God, I thank you, God, for what you're doing in this mighty woman of God's life. And I hear the Lord saying, you are a mighty woman of God. Lord, I thank you for this family. Lord, I thank you for the work you're doing in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See, God um, spoke to us about each of these people, and we didn't still want to talk about it today. We wanted to show you that God is truly working on, how many of you guys can testify what you're worried about? That while you're worrying, our God is working. And in case you missed it, if you add that up, in our first year as a church, we just blessed 30,000 people. 
for Christmas. And um, our goal here is not to be like, look at Anthem. Our goal is to be like, look at God and what God can do. Why? Because impossible is God's starting point. And we want the world to know that we serve the kind of God who no worry goes unseen and that he works while you wait on him. And so church today, this is the lesson. And listen, we're not just trying to build a big church. We're trying to bless the city because as our city prospers, so will we. And I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you who have been so faithful to continue to lead people to know Christ. How many of you guys know this is what it looks like to make Jesus known? And when the church does what the church is supposed to do, we shine the light on him for the whole world to see. And this is the message that Mary teaches us today. Teaches us that we serve the kind of God whose whose starting point is impossible. We serve the kind of God the virgin birth teaches us. It's a powerful thing that God was working on what you're worried about. And I was gonna close there, but I gotta give you one more point. Is that okay? Even if you say no, I'm gonna preach it anyways, and you're gonna get it. Because if, if you miss this today, you miss the whole point of Matthew chapter one, 18 through 25, you missed the whole point of the birth of Jesus Christ this Christmas. You see, point number three, the thing that we learn through the virgin birth through Mary is that God specializes in the impossible. Why is that a big deal? Because the power in the Christmas story is not just about Jesus' birth. The power is in how he was conceived. For if it were not for the virgin birth, Jesus' death would not have paid for your sin. The virgin birth is what makes impossible for all of us, impossible today for each of us. And as I wrap this series up, I wanna show you the most powerful thing about Jesus' family tree. I believe we saved the best for last. Can I, can I preach the gospel for a minute? You know, this year God has been reminding me, I just don't wanna talk about the gospel. We need to be sure we're preaching the gospel. Here's what we see in this story. Over the past few weeks, we've been studying this family tree of Jesus found in Matthew chapter one, how Matthew lays out 42 generations, starting with Abraham. Abraham is the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. So-and-so is the father of so-and-so. So-and-so is the father of so-and-so. And you see these five women kind of slide into the story, but even as they're slid in, they're named after father is so-and-so. But what you see in 15 verses, all of a sudden there's a break in the rhythm when you get to Jesus. Because how many of you guys know, anytime Jesus shows up, everything changes. So one through 15, we see father of so-and-so, father of so-and-so. But in Matthew 1, 16, we, we see what happens next. Jacob was the father of Joseph. So there you still see that rhythm, the husband of Mary. Now watch, it doesn't say Jake, uh, Joseph, does it? It says Mary gave birth to Jesus, who's called the Messiah. There's a break in the rhythm. For 15 verses, so-and-so is the father of so-and-so. But here in verse 16, it doesn't say that Jacob was, or Joseph was the father of Jesus. It says Mary gave birth to Jesus. And then in verse 18, it says, here's how she gave birth to Jesus. She wasn't conceived by man. She was conceived, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. Why does this matter? Why is this such a big deal? Back to the question we started with. So whose son is he? The family tree doesn't say Joseph. It says Mary became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. So why did it have to happen this way? Because there was a problem with the bloodline that God had to address and fix the blood line because the mere man, the blood of a mere man could not fix what was going on. Why? Because in Romans 5 and 12, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world and Adam's sin brought death. And so death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. And so we can quit acting like we're all perfect in church for we're all wretched sinners in his sight. For each and every one of us, this is how we were born. We were born into sin. We're bent towards sin. And so the wages of sin is death. But God in his goodness said your death should kill you. But for a season, 
Here's what I'm going to do. Instead of killing you now, I'm going to extend this a little bit. And it says in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the body is in the blood. I've given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life. The purification makes possible. And I wouldn't want to live in the Old Testament. There's too much blood. I don't like blood. But there's good reason for it. Because here's what you have to see. In other words, when the Bible speaks about blood, whether it be from an animal, a bird, or a human, blood represents life. And you can't have life without blood. And so sin entered the world when Eve ate that apple. And God came and said from the beginning, after sin entered the world, that you must die. But God in his mercy and grace said, here is what I'll do. I'll accept a substitute for you. Your sin and my sin should kill you, but I'll accept a lamb, a bull. I'll accept its blood instead of your blood. The problem though is the blood of a goat, the blood of a lamb, the blood of a thing can only pay for a little bit. It can't pay for all of it and even in the Old Testament law one man could actually pay for another man but it couldn't pay for all humanity because the blood could only cover one thing but then came one named Jesus I said then came one named Jesus and because He was born differently than you. His blood can do for you what a man's blood can't do for you. Because he was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. He was birthed in a manger, 100% man and 100% God. He was God all wrapped up in the flesh on the earth and by the power of the Holy Spirit in his blood, our God, lived a perfect life for 33 years, 33 years. It went to a cross after living a perfect life. And when he was strapped up on that tree, what you got to understand is that when they pressed the thorn into his head, that the blood that became dripping down wasn't just the blood of a man. It was the blood of God dripping for you. When they pierced his side, It wasn't just the blood poured out of him of a man. It wasn't the blood of Joseph's line. It was the bloodline of God. And when they put him on the tree and put the nails in his hand and put the nails in his feet, the blood that we shed for you. I want you to remember that it doesn't say that he spilled it. He shed it for you on purpose. And that blood that was shed for you, it wasn't, it was able, it was able to pay for your sin because his bloodline is pure. Therefore it can cover that which you can't cover. And so when Jesus said, it is finished, he defeated your sin. He washed you clean, making the impossible for you possible for you what was impossible for all those years. But how many of you guys know that Jesus didn't stop there? After he died, he went down into the grave and not only defeated sin, but when he resurrected from the grave, he defeated death. Because of that, we can have life with him. You see, the virgin birth is necessary for our salvation. Jesus' blood was the only blood that could break the curse of sin. And today, I just wanted to remind you that you know what, it's true what the old saints of God say, that the blood has not lost its power. And I wish I had a witness today that the precious blood of Jesus has not lost its power. The blood of Jesus can still redeem you. The blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus can still purify you. The blood of Jesus can still cleanse you. I think we gotta get back to the practice of pleading the blood because the blood can still heal you. The blood can still break curses in your life because there's nothing that his blood cannot do. Why? Because he wasn't born of a man. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost. He was God in flesh so he could do for you what no man could ever do. 
So today I'll go back to that question that I started with. Whose son is he? Whose son is he? You know, the Pharisees got that question right and wrong. They said, you know what, you're the son of David. They said, you know what, we'll, we'll actually look at you and say you might be king because you look the right way, but they wouldn't say you're God because they're saying you're born of a man. But my prayer today is that you're gonna answer this question this Christmas season a little bit differently, that whose son is he? Let me ask it a little bit different. Who might you say that he is? Who is God to you? My prayer is that we'll answer that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God.